Good evening, and thank you so much for joining us. I'm here to talk with you about fraternity and sorority life and so thrilled that you took the opportunity to learn more about our community. My goals during this presentation are to introduce you to the fraternity and sorority life community at the University of Michigan, to highlight the resources that are available through the fraternity and sorority life program, including numerous materials um, available on the fraternity and sorority life website, and to answer questions that you have. Key topics that we'll cover during this time are introducing our an overview of our four councils at the University of Michigan, describing the role of the FSL staff, explaining uh, information about recruitment and intake, those processes in brief, and more information uh, as people commonly ask about chapter owned housing and how that process works. Got a little ahead of myself. So if I think about those topics and the fact that many of you may have questions, I would say our agenda looks like this. I'll talk about fraternity and sorority life in general. We'll pause for questions and answers. I'll talk about recruitment and intake and then pause to see if there are any clarifying questions about that information. Then we'll talk about chapter housing and some other um, common elements that people ask about the fraternity and sorority experience and pause for questions um, about that information. I encourage you to be familiar with the question, um, question and answer feature in this app as that'll be how we communicate. I am Nicole Banks. I have the honor and privilege of serving as Assistant Dean of Students here at the University of Michigan. I've worked very closely with Fraternity and Sorority Life over the years and I've, I'm very um, pleased to be with you this evening to talk about this community. These are the actual staff members from Fraternity and Sorority Life. Starting at the top left, Dr. Travis Martin serves as the Fraternity and Sorority Life Director and is the Associate, and Associate Dean of Students. Next to Travis is Shannon Benson, who serves as the Associate Director for Fraternity and Sorority Life and also the Advisor for the Panhellenic Association. Next to Shannon is Courtney Monroe, who serves as the advisor to our culturally based fraternities and sororities and liaison to culturally based organizations. And next to Courtney at the end of the top row is Damon P who serves as an assistant director for fraternity and sorority life and advisor to the inner fraternity council. On the bottom row, Chris Kalka, starting at the left, Chris Kalka serves as the office administrator. Next to Chris is Christy Philipchuk an assistant director for Fraternity and Sorority Life, who's also responsible for organizational accountability. And then next to Christy is Vicki Dura. Vicki serves as our health and well-being program manager, and she also co-advises Panhellenic. Let's talk about the history of Fraternity and Sorority Life at Michigan in brief. We find that many students today believe that fraternity and sorority life is defined by the activities and programs they see, and they may not always understand the history behind the organizations. At Michigan in particular, fraternities and sororities that are part of the fraternity and sorority life program have been around since 1845. Our very first fraternity uh, was Beta Theta Pi, and that chapter still exists and is doing very well at the University of Michigan, but it really was the initial fraternity, social fraternity on the campus. In 1879, the first sorority was chartered on campus and that allowed um, the same support activities and fellowship to exist for women enrolled in Michigan to at least have that opportunity. Then in 1909, the first traditionally African-American fraternity was established, uh, established a charter and a chapter at the University of Michigan, which provided great support an opportunity for engagement for African-American students interested in fraternal organizations. In 2020, Fraternity and Sorority Life at Michigan reached its 175th year. Today, Michigan's Fraternity and Sorority Life program has four unique councils. The Interfraternity Council, commonly considered um, or commonly known as IFC, the Multicultural Greek Council, 
commonly referred to as the MGC, the National Panhellenic Council, commonly referred to as NPHC, and the Panhellenic Association, which commonly goes by Panhell. Here's some statistics about each of the councils. IFC consists of 16 affiliated chapters. As of this past winter semester, they had membership of 1,399 students. There's a little information there about their chapter size on average. So they're relatively large chapters. And each of the chapters were operating chapter housing. Multicultural Greek Council consists of both fraternities and sororities. There's a total of 12 chapters in the organization at this time. Their overall membership is 190 students and the average chapter size is 15, almost 16, depending on the organization. This is our youngest council at the University of Michigan. We're very proud to be able to host a council to support these organizations as they continue to grow and flourish and serve communities. The National Panhellenic Council has seven chapters. The uh, membership is up close to 80 students and you see the average chapter size noted there as well. Panhellenic Association or Panhell has 17 chapters. During the winter semester, their membership reached the number of 3,340 members. Their average chapter size is 200 and almost two students. And there are 17 recognized chapter facilities as well. So as you can tell, it's a fairly large community. We have 52 chapters that are affiliated and recognized and in good standing at the university at this time. The total membership across all 52 organizations is 5,091 students. Currently, we serve as many as 16% of the undergraduate population at Michigan. There have been years where that population served has been as high as 24%. So many, many undergraduate students are involved with fraternity and sorority organizations and programs. And the breakdown uh, for, for gender is here, 23% women and 9% men, almost 10% men. So predominantly sorority members in the organizations and in the community. This slide also has a summary, um, putting all the, the councils together with some information about how large their, their chapters are, how many chapters they each have, and whether they are fraternities, sororities, or a combination. This information only pertains to affiliated and recognized organizations. And I'll say more about what that means later on. This is a snapshot um, of the data that we compile in student life every year about the productivity of fraternities and sororities. Unless people are familiar with the organizations in terms of their purpose or purposes, they may not recognize that scholarship and service and philanthropy are important goals, longstanding goals of fraternities and sororities. The last time we had a normal or regular academic year where students had two full semesters in their organizations to achieve their annual goals was 2018, 2019, just before the pandemic uh, began in 2020. So our statistics here tell us a little bit of the highlights our organizations during that academic year served about 140 agencies and charities, collected over 8,496 items for donation, provided over 42,000 hours of community service, and through philanthropy raised over $300,000. I'd like to talk now about the role of the Fraternity and Sorority Life Department, the professional staff who I introduced uh, or named on the slide earlier. It's important to recognize that fraternities and sororities 
are private organizations working in partnership with campus communities. This graphic is an illustration of the relationship. In the far right corner at the top, you see the university is listed and the university provides uh, supervision to the fraternity and sorority life staff. In turn, the fraternity and sorority life staff oversee and work with the councils, supporting the councils um, in self-governance. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a future slide. Each council then governs its set of organizations or chapters. And every chapter is not only responsible to adhere to guidance from their council, but also to their own individual international organization listed on the left. The international organization has professional staff and alumni volunteers who work directly with their chapter members on campus and also with the staff in fraternity and sorority life. I used a term a few minutes ago, supported self-governance. Self-governance is a concept that is still very, um, is, is something that is still practiced on many campuses today, but not to the same extent it has uh, been practiced historically. At Michigan, our model is supported self-governance. We recognize and honor that fraternities and sororities are private organizations and that they come together to form councils. Their councils are groups of leaders who help to govern the set of organizations. As university partners, we support those leaders for the councils, as well as the leaders of each chapter. Working together to help students be as effective as they can be in their leadership roles, their goals for the year, working to ensure that risk management practices um, and, and other activities implementing their different programs throughout the year, are really backed by the expertise of the campus and local partners. Here are some examples of how the relationship works as it describes the role of fraternity and sorority life staff. As you read this, you'll note a number of times, there's language that talks about risk management, harm reduction, working together to support students to address misconduct, violations of policies that they create in their leadership. I think this is a good opportunity to talk about this academic year that has just ended and how we navigated the pandemic working collaboratively. Again, recognizing that each fraternity and sorority is, its, is a private organization and that what really undergirds our work together is the spirit of partnership. Also finding that many Michigan students are involved in fraternities and sororities and they and likely their families are hoping for collaborative work to preserve safety. Over this past year, our organizations like, like every and probably many or every other organization affected by COVID-19 had to change the way they operated if they were able to operate at all. The items listed on this slide give an example of the types of changes uh, that were implemented, types of experiences our leaders were needing to navigate through. Many organizations had restrictions on any level of activity. Some were not permitted to operate at all. Others were able to operate, but needed to honor the local guidance for in-person gatherings or social activities. The staff at the university partnered with the headquarters, chapter advisors, alumni, volunteers, and students to create effective coordination in support of the testing, quarantine, and isolation services that the campus was offering to every Michigan student. Fraternity and sorority life members predominantly live off campus and so it was important to establish clear communication to assist students to know that the services were available to them as well and to create access. And in some cases, coordinating transportation, in other cases, supporting assistance with, with food, but really working very closely with them in new ways to ensure that they were served while they were here. 
excuse me, and while our community has been, has been navigating COVID-19. We created strategies for enhanced communication with partners, like a webinar series. Um, we worked with organizations on a more direct level, case by case, if there were concerns affecting just their chapter members. And we really worked hard to support the public health teams on campus, those public health experts who were really addressing any outbreaks, um, trying to manage containment, and trying to mitigate spread um, of COVID-19. Some organizations needed additional support to be in compliance with the expectations of their international headquarters in ways in which those expectations may be slightly different from the local guidance or, or um, requirements around Washtenaw County, Michigan. I'd also like to note that throughout the remainder of this presentation, there are a number of photos of students and different activities. Those photos were taken prior to the pandemic. We hope to return to more in-person activity in safe ways in the future. I also expect to see a continuation of some of the innovative practices that students created um, to minimize large group gatherings where it was not essential. Also in thinking about not only council affiliation, but partnerships, it's important to also mention that each of our organizations is part of an umbrella association. And some of the umbrella associations are listed below. But on the subject of recognition, we like to provide clarification that the university recognize student recognizes student organizations. And then each of our four councils will recognize and therefore affiliate with a chapter and its members. This distinction is important at Michigan at this time, as there are many more Greek letter organizations in our campus community who are recognized by the university, but are not a part of the four councils. There are also organizations, uh, Greek letter organizations in the Michigan community that are not affiliated with the university in any way and don't have a formal relationship in any way. When you receive these slides later, or if you view this presentation uh, recording later on YouTube, I hope you will have time to read all of the material listed here and on each of the slides. This one is an overview of the benefits of chapter affiliation. As I mentioned, recognition and affiliation go hand in hand, but what's important to recognize is that there are benefits to being an affiliated organization with fraternity and sorority life. Here are some examples. They talk about leadership development opportunity and having professional staff and experts and centers across the campus assist our student leaders in being very effective in managing their chapter operations. Also, our affiliated organizations experience participation in council and community-wide programs and services. And lastly, the supported self-governance infrastructure is there in, and allows organization members and leaders to work in partnership with the university, whether they're planning events, need to reserve space on campus or need the expertise of individuals from the faculty, from public health units, or the expertise of, of law enforcement in how to manage crowds. Those are just some of the benefits of affiliation. I'll take a moment now and pause for any questions you may have. As you may have noted in the earlier slide about our agenda, there are three question and answer opportunities. Please use the chat function to submit your question or the question function to submit your question and I will review them. My intention is to cover questions about the content that has already been covered and we'll address questions in two other breaks relative to the topics that are covered during that time. While I pause to review questions, I'll put this slide up with a fun fact.
it looks like we're doing well. We may have one question coming in at this time. Pause and read it and I'll be right back. Are two questions. We'll talk. I'll talk about each of them now. The first one asks: Does the university track and publish objectives like grades, intramurals, standings, etc.? The university does track objectives for the fraternities and sororities that fraternity and sorority life supports. On the website, you would find a resource called Achievement Expectations. Those are um, seven broad goals that should shape the fraternal experience each year um, around academic progress, membership engagement, leadership development, philanthropy or service, and risk management, chapter development. Those categories allow students to set their goals each year for their chapter, look for innovative and very relevant ways to serve those goals and objectives, and then to demonstrate what they achieved into the system. And that contributes to our annual recognition for fraternity and sorority members, chapters, and councils. So the program again is called Achievement Expectations. Each year prior to the pandemic, we've been publishing an annual report that demonstrates the overall accomplishments of all of our affiliated chapters. Also, each chapter headquarters receives a copy of their chapter's performance within the achievement expectations rubric. I hope that answers the question. Someone else has asked about the pros and cons of joining fraternity and sorority life. The common description, and it's ironic because the slide that's there on screen um, has a wordle, a word cloud. Those are the things that students provided uh, in response to a survey a couple of years ago. It was very fascinating, the ways in which they described what it meant to them to be a member of a fraternity and sorority. The pros, more specifically, are creating um, relationships with a community within the larger campus community. Early on in a person's experience at Michigan, it could be their first year, their second or third year, um, most often later in the first year, but those relationships that form can allow a person to have a network early on, find academic support with new friends, new peers who may have academic experiences or program outlook that uh, program goals that are similar to their own. And people who are interested in common causes and uh, different interests. So the relationship building aspect is one of the um, pros that students talk about the most students and alumni, quite honestly. If I had to say there was a con, I, I don't exactly consider it a con, but it really does depend on the student. Joining a fraternity or a sorority, um, joining alone can create access to many, many things. Getting involved with special projects of your chapter or serving in a leadership role later on in your experience um, can really take quite a bit of time. I, I, again, I don't really consider it a con because the person would only pursue it, I imagine, if they could handle that um, and if they're passionate for it, as most of our students are passionate for leading and serving in their organizations or with a community focus or supporting certain causes. So I qualify that one with it. It may not exactly be a con. It depends on the student. Okay, so those are the two questions for this time. We will I'll, we'll pause for other questions and, and respond to them in just a little bit. Now let's talk about recruitment and intake. As I mentioned, there are more than 50 fraternities and sororities that are part of the FSL program at the University of Michigan. Naturally, there are different pathways for chapters to gain new members. Some chapters use a formal recruitment process 
only. Some use a combination of formal and informal recruitment, and some follow a process that's called intake. I'll say a little more about each of those in just a moment. Intake and recruitment for the Multicultural Greek Council and the National Panhellenic Councils are processes that are very chapter driven. Students who are interested in joining or learning more about MGC and NPHC chapters should contact the organizations to learn their calendar of activities, which are usually for the campus community, for other students or for local communities, tend to be community facing programs. Those opportunities allow students to become familiar with the members, the principles and values of the organizations and their annual goals and objectives. MGC and NPHC fraternities and sororities manage their recruitment and intake processes individually. After a student meets the university eligibility process, which I'll talk about a little more momentarily, each chapter determines their interest in bringing a person into the organization. Each of the councils have, have a site on the Fraternity and Sorority Life site, and students who are interested in learning more about MGC and NPHC can go to that, uh, those areas on the Fraternity and Sorority Life website. In the start of the fall, during the fall, students will be able to see a calendar of activities, opportunities uh, just to get more information and learn more about what their members in these organizations have been up to their points of pride, and what's on the horizon for the academic year. Our IFC and Panhellenic fraternities and sororities commonly practice what's called formal recruitment. Formal recruitment will have um, an official start date, a period of time for getting familiar with chapters, and then an official end date and a bid day. Those milestones are common across IFC fraternities and Panhellenic sororities. They are fairly formal. There will also be marketing and information available online. Eligible students would have the opportunity to attend an info session to learn about the councils and the chapters within and have opportunities to meet the members of each organization in which they, they may be interested. Formal recruitment at Michigan happens during the winter semester. Informal recruitment is also a practice for IFC and Panhell. Eligible students could be offered a bid to join a fraternity or sorority outside of formal recruitment. There are different guidelines for the inner fraternity council fraternities around navigating informal recruitment from the processes for the Panhellenic Association. It's important to recognize that not every chapter participates in formal or informal recruitment. That can be true in the fall or the winter or throughout the year. For Panhellenic Association, the process which is called continuous open bidding is practiced. It occurs in both fall and winter semesters. During the fall, continuous open bidding is, is, uh, is the recruitment opportunity that's, that women may find. And during the winter, continuous open bidding may happen after the formal recruitment process ends. Again, not all chapters will participate and it's not in, uh, the continuous open bidding process is not one that is formalized with an official start date, a series of activities for all chapters involved and an official end date. For the Interfraternity Council, informal recruitment takes place very commonly during fall and winter. And again, any student participating in any type of recruitment or intake must first meet the institutional eligibility criteria, which I'll describe for you soon. 
So the councils and the individual chapters coordinate their recruitment and intake opportunities with oversight from fraternity and sorority life and in conjunction with their national headquarters guidelines. Michigan is an institution that has institutional eligibility requirements for students interested in recruitment and intake. The goal of the institutional eligibility is to support a student to establish a positive academic record, learn about the university and its resources, experience a variety of programs and offerings on campus, learn what's expected from fraternities and sororities, and just explore their opportunities for membership and belonging um, on campus before they join. Membership in fraternities and sororities in FSL is a lifetime opportunity. So it's important for students to be established, be comfortable and recognize the commitment they would be making. There are four general criteria for students um, to be considered eligible to join fraternities and sororities. They must be a continuing or transfer student. And what that means is that our first semester, first year student who is not transferring to the university but coming in as a first time freshman would not be eligible to join a fraternity or a sorority or participate in recruitment or intake until they have earned at least 12 post-secondary credit hours. Those credit hours will not, um, are not inclusive of test scores or credits earned while in high school. This includes dual enrollment um, and any other AP courses and credits. Enrollment status is another criteria. A student must be enrolled in the term in which they would like to participate in intake and recruitment. So they wouldn't be participating in a joining process during a semester when they have no classes. The student must be in good standing. And this is to the students, uh, this is out of concern and support for students and their academic well being and their personal well being. They must be considered in good standing not only with the Office for Student Conflict Resolution, but also with their school and college. They should not be on academic probation or disciplinary probation. And again, since the prior criteria said they must be enrolled, they should not be on a suspension during the time they're seeking to join a fraternity or a sorority. The fourth area of the criteria is to complete the fraternity and sorority life educational module. It's an online module using the Canvas system where most uh, classes have supplemental material and some online coursework exists and online courses um, are hosted there as well. In Canvas, students can explore the fraternity and sorority life educational module long before they ever plan to pursue membership. But completing the course and uh, passing the final quiz with a score of 100% is another requirement. This course provides great information and detail for students who are interested in fraternity and sorority life about the pros, about the communities, and about key dates, expectations, and the financial commitment. I'd like to emphasize this as often as I can when speaking with um, families and students who are joining the Michigan community um, in the fall. It's important that they recognize that as a result of our eligibility criteria as an institution, most first year students will not be eligible to join any of the chapters until second semester or later. Many of our organizations recruit first year students during that year. However, many others recruit upper class students and it's far more common. So we want students to recognize that if it is something that they're interested in doing, they will have an opportunity, but they're also expected to get to know Michigan before they join. 
here are some activities and things to consider um, for students who are thinking about recruitment and intake. We in Fraternity and Sorority Life really focus on promoting to students that they really be thoughtful and not just decide automatically that they're going to join a fraternity or a sorority. Thoughtfulness is really important because the commitment we think is special. In speaking with students about fraternity and sorority membership and their potential uh, joining or their interest, we talk with them about the purpose of the organizations, the values of the organizations and the FSL program, and the fact that there is a campus benefit, campus and community benefit to having dedicated student organizations that focus on scholarship, service, and philanthropy. So a student has decided to go through recruitment or intake. Now what? This is just another spin, uh, another way to look at the things that a person should do to not only learn about the community, but to actually enter themselves into our online platform, which is called a recruitment and intake gateway to learn and also to establish their own or demonstrate their own eligibility. We consider this to be the eligibility verification process. The steps are here. They're also on the Fraternity and Sorority Life website under the tab that says, join us. I'll pause now for more questions and answers. And as I pause, I'll put up another slide with just an FSL fun fact while I read what's in the queue from Q&A. Okay, I was pleased to find the questions that were waiting there for me. They give me an opportunity to say a little more. The first question is asking, what is the initiation process like for fraternities? And so that's a, it's a broad question because we have fraternities in three of our four councils. The, the initiation process, and I realize it says initiation, but I'll say new member process should be an orientation to the organization, its histories, its infrastructure, the expectations of members, the bylaws, um, regulations that really govern how the chapter is designed to operate according, in accordance uh, with its national or international headquarters. The new member education component for each organization should also include opportunities for members to get to know one another in a chapter and participate in goal setting for the future of the chapter. It could be for the next semester or for the next year. There are, of course, ritualistic activities that will take place in an initiation process. There should not be any hazing. At Michigan, we educate students in fraternity and sorority life and really um, most large student organization communities um, and some of our programs, including varsity athletics, Michigan marching band and ROTC. We educate students about hazing, including subtle hazing, harassment hazing, and physical hazing or violent hazing. We talk with them about Garrett's law and the standards, but most importantly, we bring them back to principle and the expectation that students will not create harm for any other person in the campus community. And hazing would definitely fall into that category, no matter what form of hazing there is. We also encourage families, alumni, volunteers, and other students on campus outside of fraternity and sorority life to report any concerning activities that they observe or learn about, whether it's on social media, directly from a student who is in the process of joining a fraternity or sorority, or something they hear third party. We like to take, very, um, take student safety very seriously, and we will look into any uh, report or complaint that might involve hazing. The next question I see um, asks about PANHEL recruitment and whether or not it's in the winter or the fall. And I'll, I'll use the formal language because it may be helpful when you review materials on Fraternity and Sorority Life website or the chapter websites. Formal recruitment is in the winter. Informal recruitment, which for PANHEL is continuous open bidding, could happen during the fall or the winter. And just to reiterate, formal recruitment 
is a calendar, a program that is really established by the council that will have an opening period with information sessions, scheduled activities that help acquaint and introduce students to each of the chapters in the council and a formal close period where chapters have to decide if they are inviting members to join and there's a process of matching people up. So formal recruitment is in the winter. Continuous open bidding where an individual may be getting familiar with a chapter independently, that can happen during the fall or during the winter for Panhellenic, um, actually for Panhellenic and for IFC. Other two councils don't use the terminology recruitment very often, um, and they don't use continuous open bidding. Next question asks, can students start the module now? Yes, they can. And we really encourage students um, who are interested in fraternity and sorority life um, membership to go on the FSL website as early as they can, recognize that they will find dates, deadlines, opportunities to um, meet the chapters, there'll be a lot of things that um, they can participate in during the fall. So if they have a chance to look at the information during the summer, the late summer, it'll help them plan their approach. And one last question. Do I know if most sororities encourage recommendation letters during for formal recruitment? I believe this question pertains to the sororities in Panhel. Um, so I'll answer from that perspective because the Multicultural Greek Council and the National Panhellenic Council also have sororities, um, but their sororities do not, not require or, or commonly use letters of recommendation in the same way. So um, I would encourage us to check with Panhel to see if recommendation letters are a practice that they will continue or bring back. It has not been required. Um, in some instances, it may have been helpful, but it hasn't been required in, in a while, in a couple of years. All right. We'll have another break for questions and answers uh, coming up shortly. For now, we'll move on. And the fun fact on this slide is that um, asks, did you know that Michigan has over 120 Greek letter organizations? I think I spoiled this one earlier by talking about this. It's important, especially when we, uh, when we talk about fraternity and sorority life recruitment, intake and membership, because the other Greek letter organizations on Michigan at, um, on campus at the University of Michigan will not be following the same schedule necessarily um, of the organizations in the four councils that are part of fraternity and sorority life. So students would want to make that distinction. There are so many other opportunities um, in honors and academic, um, pre-professional and professional societies on campus. There are different experiences from fraternities and sororities in FSL. Some students are members of the social fraternities in FSL, as well as the academic and honors, honorary, and pre-professional or professional organizations on campus. Also, if you ever have a concern about the practices of an organization, whether it's a concern, a question, comment, or kudos, it's important to recognize how large the, the uh, population of student organizations with Greek letter names are at Michigan. So sometimes people may reach out and wanna share good news, but they don't have the full name of the organization. I really encourage you to uh, become more and more aware of those organizations across the board. And when there's news to share or a question or a concern, be ready to share the full name of the organization. Thank you. Okay. So now we'll transition into chapter housing for IFC and Panhellenic. I like to include this information when speaking uh, with incoming students and families because we recognize that each campus can have a different relationship to fraternity and sorority housing. At the University of Michigan, chapter facilities are private property that are technically off campus. So the relationships I talked about earlier in this presentation with regard to um, the governance model and, and our partnerships, 
that is how we're able to support the experiences um, and services in some ways for our chapter facilities. It is not a direct management or oversight relationship. But we like for students to understand that living in a chapter housing for IFC and Panhell chapters is a common expectation of membership. It's important to know this in coming into the University of Michigan in the first year, because it is common for students to sign leases for their second year during the fall semester. On one hand, it's not a problem to plan for the next year during the fall, though some people can be concerned about making those choices too early. On the other hand, if a student would like to join or explore joining a Panhellenic or IFC chapter, if they are offered membership and join the organization, the organization may expect them to actually lease in the chapter facility. And we don't want students to end up with two leases. So that's why we encourage people to recognize uh, this expectation that is common. As a side note, IFC and Panhell are the only councils whose chapters offer chapter housing. The housing in each case may not really be large enough to serve all of the chapter members. It may serve a large portion, and it is very common for the remainder of the members to live together in apartments and um, medium or large size houses around campus, just as friends co-leasing. This type of living arrangement is actually common for all four of our councils, whether they offer chapter housing or not. Commonly upper class students during their junior and senior year, and in some cases during their sophomore year, depending on the organization, will lease together with their close friends who are also their fraternity and sorority um, peers their fellow members. Also on this slide, we talk about um, the housing is often filled by the new members. Another reason why it's important for a person who wants to explore membership to not quickly sign an off-campus lease elsewhere. Our potential new members, <clears throat> excuse me, should always consult with their council or chapters about the expectations of membership regarding housing. This can be done during an informal or formal recruitment process. And the question can be very direct. Is there an expectation that if I join this organization, I would live in the chapter facility next year? And if that is an expectation, what is the process? What are the fees? What is the timeline? We help students to anticipate um, learning all of that information if they are considering joining um, one of the IFC or Penn Health chapters. Families also have talked about the fact that the costs of living in a chapter facility tend to be comparable to on-campus housing. And so students are able to not only find um, a variety of amenities um, being offered in a chapter facility, but they also find the costs commonly to be comparable to living on campus. Because we recognize the tendency for people to sign leases for the next year during the fall semester, we've been encouraging students to take time before signing. This actually shows up on campus as an activity, a program series with housing fairs and information sessions to help student un, students at Michigan understand the variety of off-campus living opportunities that exist and the importance of really discerning which is best for themselves before they sign a lease, including, as I mentioned, if they're interested in joining fraternities and sororities. These programs are offered in partnership with the first year experience program. And there may be um, speaking engagements and virtual sessions in the, for students in residence halls, activities promoted through the Dean of Students Office and online with the Beyond the Diag and off-campus partners web information and throughout student affairs, including the newsletters that are sent to students and families. Another important note for students who are considering joining any fraternity or sorority um, during this coming academic year, 
is that if one of their other options for the next year's housing would be to live on campus, the deadlines for applying to live in a residence hall are generally after formal recruitment with IFC and Panhell end. So a student could navigate that entire process um, with IFC or with Panhell, make a decision if they're offered um, a bid or membership into one of the fraternities or sororities, but also still have the option to request to live on campus. For instance, if they don't join a fraternity or a sorority that they're offered membership, um, for which they're offered membership, they would still have time to um, apply to live in university residence halls. These are some of the benefits um, of the Panhel chapter facilities. I'll give you a moment to read them. What's talked about the most for, for um, new members that I'm aware of, uh, are people are very impressed with the facilities themselves, how well maintained they are, the amenities that are offered, the fact that there are live-in house directors um, available to support the students living in the chapter facilities, and that their locations are really good um, and very um, in close proximity to the central campus close to some of the transportation options too, like the city bus line, as well as the Michigan blue bus line. Information about chapter facilities and the chapter housing process, including summaries of the expenses are available on the Fraternity and Sorority Life website. So we encourage you to look there as well, if it's something you're considering. So one other special note, as we think about um, fraternities and sororities and being off campus is the fact that at the University of Michigan, and I mentioned this earlier in the presentation, there are disaffiliated fraternities. They are fraternities that have left recognition and partnership with the university either voluntarily or they were asked to, uh, they, they lost their recognition. Um, as a result of misconduct. The Fraternity and Sorority Life website provides a list by council of each fraternity and sorority that is recognized, each fraternity and sorority that is suspended or inactive, but may return, and then each fraternity and sorority that has voluntarily disaffiliated or has lost their recognition and affiliation because of misconduct. We like to encourage families to review that information so that if their student is interested in joining fraternities and sororities and is unable to tell which organizations work in partnership with the university versus those that are not in partnership with the university, or as I mentioned earlier, they may not be a part of the FSL community, but a different type of fraternity or sorority, we like to make sure that information is readily available. Okay, so we'll pause for our third um, Q&A moment. And I'm going to up one more fun fact slide while I mute and read the questions. Okay, two really good questions here. The first one asks, should freshmen attend the NPHC open house in September, even though they're not eligible until winter semester? So the National Panhellenic Council, our historically African-American fraternities and sororities may have an information session um, in the fall semester. It would be open to the public. They would welcome first year students to come by and learn about the organizations and it would likely not be an entry point to pursuing membership. It would be general information, again, open to any student without any expectation or obligation to express the desire to join or um, to follow up with any of the organizations regarding membership at that time. And this should be true for all four councils during the fall. A student who is not eligible can attend an open house or 
students may call them information sessions, informationals, meet and greet. Um, variety of names may be used. And if it is marketed as an open house, there is no expectation that a person who participates is expecting to join during the same semester. So we encourage students to take advantage of those open opportunities to learn more about the organizations and the memberships at Michigan. And then the second question asks, so no fall rush? And so I guess another fun fact that I would say is that um, we don't use the term rush anymore. And I, I just worked that in there because I do have another slide with that fun fact. But um, instead, we talk about recruitment and intake. But in the context of IFC and Panhel, recruitment can be formal or informal. IFC and Panhel can have informal recruitment in the fall focused on students who are eligible. And IFC and Panhel can have informal recruitment during the winter, usually after their formal recruitment process, again, focused on students who are eligible. For MGC, and MG, NPHC, they may also um, recruit or market to new students or interested students during the fall. I meant to say potential new members or new members, but really they'll say to interested students during the fall, but only um, should only extend an invitation to join to students who are eligible. Yes, you will see recruitment activity on campus both semesters. What's important to recognize is that there is an eligibility criteria, set of criteria for participation. Chapters are held accountable to it. Councils are held accountable to it. Incoming students should recognize that system and honor the system. We don't use the term at Michigan. I guess this is a side note. We don't use the term at Michigan um, winter recruitment because it suggests to some people that there's no recruitment activity during the fall. Some other campuses use that terminology and the explanation I gave is true, that they really only hold recruitment activities at all during the winter. We actually have recruitment and intake practices both semesters. The key is that students need to be eligible to participate. I see a couple more questions have come in. As we've been answering, I'm going to read them really quickly in my, to myself and, and see if, we, if they're similar or not. One question asks, is it a, is it a better option um, to join a fraternity or sorority that is partnered with the university? Absolutely. Whether you are a student or a family member, having a person come into a community the size of our campus um, with all of the opportunities and all of the programs and services um, and things in which students might decide to participate or engage. I think there are many more benefits to being able to have full transparency about what the organization offers, what their practices are throughout the year, their calendar of, of events, and what accountability there is for them, what, form, uh, what forms of governance, and in our case, in fraternity and sorority life, it's um, supported self-governance and then trans, uh, transparency around the accountability measures. What were the outcomes? Was there an investigation if there was a concern? If a member filed a grievance, was it addressed? So the transparency, the support for their self-governance, the use and benefit of the expertise of different campus centers um, and, and the opportunity to really be a part of the community in the community, having joint activities with other organizations in the community. Those are things that we feel are really um, more advantageous than joining an organization that has uh, decided to, to be outside of that community and outside of those risk management and other safety practices. Now, I don't mean that to say that headquarter organizations don't have safety practices or risk management practices for their chapters but without working in partnership with the larger community of fraternities and sororities, and without working in partnership with the university, having um, an example of that is where there may be um, an investigation into complaint. If someone is found responsible and if there, is, um, if there are sanctions, that is fully transparent. On the FSL website, it will be clear. 
Any students involved in the matter will work with the professional staff, either in fraternity and sorority life, the Center for Campus Involvement, or the Office for Student Conflict Resolution to understand how to move forward in a restorative way, in a healthy way. We don't know to what extent organizations that are not affiliated with the university at all have those measures in place or can provide that transparency, follow through and support. Let's see, there's one more question. Um, do you have to come back early to campus for winter for, to participate in recruitment in the winter from the break between semesters? At this time, no. And Panhellenic um, formal recruitment and the IFC formal recruitments do not require students to return to campus early. There was a year where that was um, offered to students for Panhellenic primary or formal recruitment. And students who primarily live in residence halls as first year students were able to come back into the residence halls before classes began, but as soon as the halls opened and then use the days before classes began to get started with uh, the primary recruitment. But that was a previous year. I don't think that will be the case this year. Um, it didn't happen in 2021, but recruitment activities for Panhell were virtual. So very good question. Thank you all uh, for your questions. There are a number of frequently asked questions on the Fraternity and Sorority Life website. I encourage you to take some time when you're on the site looking in other areas to also look at the FAQs. A few closing notes I'd like to make sure I reiterate, um, especially as we are still navigating through the pandemic. Um, every affiliated Fraternity and Sorority Life chapter will be encouraged and supported to implement their programs and activities in accordance with the local public health guidelines and the regulations of their international headquarters. Our staff, by working directly with each chapter president um, and leadership board and working directly with each council, will be able to support students to understand the expectations around public health this year and also to adhere to them. If there are challenges in chapters, our staff will also assist students to, make, to take corrective action. Um, also working in partnership with chapter advisors um, who are often alumni volunteers. Students who are interested in joining a chapter should be sure to know the important criteria, deadlines, and fees for recruitment and intake. It's very common that a full calendar for each council will be on the FSL website by the beginning of September, usually around move-in, so it could be late August. Those are good times to look for dates, um, dates and opportunities to meet and greet, deadlines for anything um, formal for a person uh, looking to potentially join when they become eligible. And it's common for students to begin that process um, during the, la the latter part of their first semester, so that as soon as fall semester grades post and the semester is ended, they meet the eligibility and can be registered for um, formal recruitment if it is IFC and Pan Health. So they don't have to wait, long story made short. Um, and then for recruitment and intake during the winter semesters, students really do need to recruit uh, to complete the RIG verification. Again, that's the recruitment and intake gateway. That verification process begins with uh, the links that are on the Fraternity and Sorority Life website under the Join Us tab. It'll take them first to the module I talked about earlier. And then within the module, there's instructions for how to explore chapters in any of the four councils. If the student is interested in joining organizations that are part of IFC or PANHEL, they'll also have the information in that module of how to register for IFC recruitment or PANHEL primary recruitment. So really important that they know where to start. That is on the join us tab and recognize that the module provides the information that leads them through the recruitment and intake gateway all of the verification steps and key information. And as always, uh, please know that we're always working hard to make sure that you can find useful and relevant information on the Fraternity and Sorority Life website. Um, many things, um, many of the areas will have content that students maintain. And so 
while it's the summer, you may not see as much new content in every area, but the staff, the professional staff maintains probably 90% of the information. So aside from calendars of activities for chapters, the staff really provides uh, the content around expectations and guidelines, contact information for headquarters, umbrella associations, chapters, um, pretty much anything you need. And you can always contact fraternity and sorority life staff. I'd like to take this moment to let you know that fraternity and sorority life is a part of the Dean of Students Office organizations. You may contact fraternity and sorority life for any needs, and you can also contact the Dean of Students Office. These are some informational slides that I just put in here. Um, some photos are from before the pandemic. I hope they help you recognize this vibrant, hardworking um, community that is Fraternity and Sorority Life at Michigan. Very diverse organizations, longstanding organizations, up and coming organizations, relationships that will last a lifetime. These students have really worked hard. We're really proud of what students and the chapters accomplish each year for themselves as members and members of our community and for the larger communities that they support. Thank you very much for being here this evening and for listening to this webinar. Have a good night.